Girl. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Have we had a good week? Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and stand as we sing with each other this morning. Conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. the giants fall you cannot survive when we praise you the God of breakthroughs on our side forever lift him high with all creation cry God we praise you oh, 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 oh. we praise you oh, 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 oh. let faith be the song that Faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. seat and check out this video. Good morning and welcome to South Creek. We are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you're here in person or if you're watching us online, please know that you are loved. Make sure that you go ahead and fill out um, a connection card if you are newer here or have a prayer request. Um, we would just love to connect with you a little bit that way. If you are new here, make sure you fill out a connection card and take it to our connection center out in the lobby where we have a special gift just for you. 
There are lots of things happening around the church. Um, coming up, we have the fundraiser dinner. That is going to be February 20th from 5.30 to 7. Um, South Creek Church God Community Outreach Team and Belong, our youth group, are hosting that. Um, they've got a really fun night planned with entertainment, um, really good food, dessert, photo op, all kinds of fun stuff. It's not just for couples. So if you are single, if you want to bring your family, we welcome everybody. It's just going to be a good time. If you are newer to South Creek, we want to make sure um, you get signed up for our Creekside Chat. That is a time to eat lunch right after church on February 27th. Lasts about an hour. Um, we'll get to sit with the staff, get to know us a little bit more about our church, and we would love to have you there. You can sign up on your connection card or contact the office. Nerf Night is coming. That is a whole family event for kids probably four years old um, up. We'll provide goggles and darts. You can bring your own Nerf guns. We'll have a couple here. Um, we'll serve snacks and nachos. You'll pay $10 at the door March 4th, and you can sign up online for that as well. South Creek Preschool enrollment is happening now, so make sure if you have a kiddo um, ages two years all the way up to pre-K age, like five years old, you want to make sure you get signed up soon. Um, we have enrollment forms out in the lobby, or you can talk to Miss Megan, myself, or you can talk to Ramona in the office to get signed up. We would love to get you connected more at South Creek. If you aren't currently serving, um, we have lots of spots where we could use your help. Um, door greeters, kids check-in, back in South Creek kids from the nursery all the way up to fifth grade. We would love to get you involved. Our tech team could use people and our worship ministry could always use people as well. You can sign up on your connection card for that or talk to one of us staff. Speaking of serving, um, if you feel a call on your heart, we would love to get you more involved. Um, we are looking for leaders to host Bible studies or life groups. If that is something that you're feeling you would be able to do, um, please make sure you fill that out on your connection card as well. If you have kiddos who are in the long youth group, um, we are not going to meet today, Super Bowl Sunday. Um, enjoy time with your family, and we will resume again next Sunday when we start to get ready for our fundraiser. Thank you so much for listening to these announcements. Um, let's go ahead and get ready for more worship. If you want to go ahead and stand up, um, we're going to get back into the music. Thanks, Miss Megan. <laughs> if you guys would stand and pray with me, we're going to continue this morning in worship. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for all of these people here and watching online and opening their hearts to you, Lord, um, to hear your message today. And um, Lord, just help us continue, not just today, but every day, shining your light and sharing your word and um, just living you through us, Lord. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, his free.
no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Shroud and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. I am His, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Till He returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ we stand Amen. So sometimes when, when we think about worship, I think we think about music. We've got, you know, the genre of worship that we all have playlists to, or, you know, we go to worship conferences where it's really based around music, but there's more to it than that. And one way we worship is by the giving of our offerings. So as the ushers come forward this morning, I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering. God, we thank you for the way that you love us and all that you do for us. As we enter our time to give back to you, I pray that you take this offering that we give and bless it and multiply it to develop your kingdom. And it's your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning, South Creek. My name is Aaron Perry. I am the lead pastor here at South Creek. And as you might have noticed, I am not there with you. Uh, 
my lovely wife, Hunter, uh, got us tickets for Christmas to see a musical up in Michigan. And so we are having a great weekend up uh, in God's country, as we uh, like to refer to it. And so I am not there with you, which is a bummer, but I am so incredibly excited for you because this morning you have the opportunity to hear from one of my favorite people. Uh, this morning, uh, my good friend Kirk Bookout, who has been a pastor for many years, is going to be speaking and continuing in our series called Fish and Loaves Faith. And Kirk comes with a wealth of experience and wisdom, in particular in the area of faith and stewardship. Kirk was a pastor in local churches for many years, and then kind of the second half of his ministry career, he focused in on working with national and international uh, ministry partners that, in particular, he had the expertise and uh, the experience to work oftentimes on helping people take steps of faith and living generously to advance some incredible kingdom missions. Now, you might remember if you've been around here for a while, Kirk last was working uh, for a great ministry called Children of Promise. And so he is not a stranger to our church, uh, but I'm so excited for him to share some of the wisdom and some of the stories and some of the great things that God has taught him about how when we are people who put our faith in Jesus, when we open our hands to what he has for us and we open our hands with what God has given us, how some incredible things can happen for us and in particular how our faith can grow. So friends, I hope and pray that you will have your ears and your hearts open to the message that God has laid on my friend Kirk's heart. And would you please give a warm welcome to Pastor Kirk Bookout as he opens up God's word this morning. I think I'm 6'4 on the inside, until I don't. <laughs> it is so good to be uh, with South Korea. I've got to tell you, I have, um, I have been in the Kokomo area three times in the last three months, and I have looked for South Creek. And let me tell you something, I have found it. It is here. This is where South Creek is. So if you're around Kokomo and someone says, I don't know where South Creek is, you know where to tell them. It is right here. Uh, I've been here before. It is my joy and pleasure uh, to be with you. I consider Aaron a good friend, and uh, so I'm especially honored that he's uh, given me the opportunity to share with you today. And I'm looking forward to it. I was, I was not raised in a church family. I started going to church maybe sometime before my 16th birthday, maybe my 15th year. And when I started going to church, I discovered that there were rules about church that nobody ever published. When to stand up, when to sit down. Back then, I did not know that when you prayed, you were supposed to say thee and thou. Uh, we have somehow got past that, uh, which is fine with me. And so I made a lot of mistakes when I came to church. There's still a few rules that we ought to have when we, when we go to church. For example, if you really, really love bubble gum, it's probably best not to pop your bubble gum during prayer time, don't you think? And this is Super Bowl Sunday, and I, I just don't think it's a good idea to wear your hat to church on Super Bowl Sunday. And let me just say, go Colts. So, I've also been told white kickoffs at 6.30, so we have a lot of time today, and I'm, I'm thankful uh, for that. I told someone in the back row that uh, I could preach till 6.30, and then I confessed, I'm not going to do that, it's just going to seem like that. So, we'll see how that goes too. There are other rules that we need, to, we can go to the next slide, yeah, that you need to follow in church. If I'm in your church... Your church needs to have a rule that I am never allowed to sing if a microphone is near me. When, when I first started going to church, I didn't know what to do, so I, I joined the choir. And the leader of the choir came to me and told me I could stay in the choir if I would lip sync. Uh, because I was throwing everybody off. That really happened. That, that really happened. Uh, there, and there are other things. It's, it's probably best if you don't text in church. No texting unless, right now, if you want to pull your phone out and say, this is going to be unbelievable, 
Now I get over to South Creek. Well, I know where South Creek is. It's right here. Get over here right now. When I started in ministry, I, I look back and I'm really rather amazed. I became a Christian when I was 16. By the time I was 23, I was pastor of a church. A church called me and I had only preached maybe three times, maybe four in my entire life. I had never been to a board of trustees meeting or church council, which was the way everybody did it back then. And they asked me to be the pastor of the church. And I was full of enthusiasm and I was smart. I was smart enough to know I hardly knew anything. So I called the leaders together and we talked about what I ought to do. And then I asked them, what should I speak about? And they said, the Bible. I could do that. They said, Jesus is good. You could speak about Jesus. And they were really big on the Holy Spirit in that church. So be sure to preach a lot about the Holy Spirit. Social issues, they got a little bit nervous when we started talking about social issues. And then they brought up a subject and they said there was one thing that they didn't think I should ever speak about in church. Money. Don't speak about money. We don't think you should do that. I have traveled uh, nationally for 20 years, over 40 Sundays a year in various churches. And it's very common, or maybe I should say not uncommon, that a pastor would come up to me and say, we don't talk about money in our church. And when I ask them why, it's really a rhetorical question because I already know what they're going to say. They say this almost 100% of the time. They're nervous because they don't want people to think that the only reason we want them to come to church is for their money. I think I can say this with a tremendous amount of confidence to you folks today. You already know that this church doesn't want you to be part of this Christian fellowship because of your money. You know that this church cares for you. You know that when you have worship, the idea is to help us to grow closer to God and to serve Him better. You know that if you need someone to pray for you, there will be someone who will pray for you. If you fellowship, there's opportunity. You know that this church is not about seeing how much of your money they can get. In fact, the only times that I really ran into that, I can remember I, I was pastoring in Alexandria. I was pastor to Aaron Mercer's parents. I guess him too when he came. No, he was in college a lot of the time I was there. But uh, I remember someone walking up to me on the street in Alexandria saying, well, you're pastor of that church. And mentioned my church and he said, yeah. He said, well, I don't, I don't go there because I don't want to be told about money all the time. All they care about is my money. And I said, really? And I said, well, well where do you go to church? He said, I don't go to church. The only time I personally have had people come up and make that charge is people who've not really gone to church anyway. If they came to this church, isn't it true that they would know that you would care for them as people? I hope I, I, mean, I want to see some nodding heads here. You think I can't see you with these lights in my eyes, but I can. That's true. And yet, yet people worry about that. And yet today, your pastor asked me to speak about money and then left town. <laughs> sure, they're going to some play up in Michigan. Of course, that's what they're doing. And so I do want to speak with you about that. And part of what I do might sound like a sermon to you. I don't know. But let me just share with you that what I want to do from my heart today is simply share with you from my heart why my wife and I, my wife Debbie and I, love to give and why we love to give uh, to the church. And so I see this more of a testimony than a sermon, although the first point sounds a little bit like a sermon, of course. The first reason that Debbie and I just love to give is because we're Christian and Jesus Christ is Lord of all of our life, everything in life. What part of my life is not Christian? Sometimes people around me will, will talk about their spiritual lives and they'll talk about various things like prayer or, or things like that. And I, ha I use that phrase occasionally too, my spiritual life. But if you get me in a mood and you start talking about your spiritual life, it's likely that I'm going to say to you, 
Well, tell me, what part of your life is not spiritual? When we give our life to God, don't we give our entire life to God, everything that we are? In fact, stewardship's much more than money. There's stewardship of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Everything in my life belongs to the Lord. We give our life to the Lord, and that means that everything in our life is given to the Lord. So Debbie and I give because Jesus is Lord of our life, and what we do with what we have reflects something about our relationship with Jesus Christ, our relationship with the Lord. In fact, as I understand it, that's really the primary purpose of tithing. When you hear the word tithing, that's a really fancy church word. It means 10%. That's all that it really means. Back in the Old Testament, when we talk about tithing, the, the first passage that I'm aware of in the Old Testament that talks about tithing is in Deuteronomy 14. And it's really kind of interesting because God tells us why he wants us to tithe. Make an offering of 10% a tithe. And then he talks about various ways people back then that could tithe because they didn't have banks and MasterCard. In this way, by tithing, in this way you will learn to live in deep reverence before God, your God, as long as you live. God is saying that when I want you to tithe, it is to help you to remember where the focus of your life is. The primary purpose for tithing for Devi and I is not so much God, but to remind us where our priorities are. Because what we do with what we have is a spiritual issue. And we believe that because Jesus is Lord of our life, that we give our entire life to him and it pleases God for us to tithe. That is the starting point of giving in our life. We are sure to give 10%. So if I'm convinced that God wants me to give 10% and... A few years ago, I was invited to go to a minister's meeting and to speak about stewardship, time, treasure, talent. And when I got there, speaking to this group of ministers about stewardship, which is a group that, a subject that makes some nervous, the leader who invited me came up to me just before I was to speak. And he said, we're really looking forward to you talking about stewardship in the church and how it should work. There's just one thing. You're not allowed to speak about tithing. And I was getting this from a minister. So I said, well, well, why? And he said, because tithing is not New Testament. It's Old Testament. It's Old Testament law. We're beyond that. And so the New Testament doesn't teach tithing. So we had a theological discussion. I had a theological answer for him. And this was my answer. Oh, yeah? <laughs> this is, and frankly, tithing is not emphasized in the New Testament. This is Jesus when he's talking to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Now, let me just say it's probably a not good thing when Jesus begins by saying to you, woe to you. You don't want that to happen. That's not a good thing. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, though, were very religious. They were absolutely dedicated in the tiniest ways that they could, could think to live and do exactly what God wanted to do. And so they did that, and, and that builds an attitude where you look at others who are not, and you tend to be judgmental. But this is what Jesus said to these people who were so careful to do everything perfectly. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, Mercy, faithfulness. You should have pr practiced the latter, latter without neglecting the former. When I read this, do you sometimes read the scripture and you read not only the words, but you kind of get the feel for it, the tone? To me, when I read that passage of scripture, when Jesus says, well, you should practice tithing. You should practice the latter, but don't neglect, don't neglect the really important things. To me, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, oh, yeah. You should tithe. Of course you should tithe. 
But there are things that are more important. Quite frankly, Debbie and I tithe. There are people who make the same amount of money that Debbie and I make who own a few more things than we own. But I will tell you, it is such joy. And it is blessed because it reminds us to keep our priorities in the right spot. We believe we are following God. We think we are rewarded in so many ways that we could hardly count. It doesn't make, mean we make more money. So for us, giving the tithe, once we got in the swing of it, we started doing it, it became part of our life because we believed it pleased God. I'll tell you what the hard things are for me. Things like justice. When we hear justice, sometimes we say we demand justice and we tend to think of that as punishment. But justice is much more than punishment, isn't it? In fact, the Old Testament and Jesus speaks a lot about standing up and helping those who are in need. Speaking and being the voice for people who have no voice. The downtrodden, lifting them up. Forgiving those that others will not forgive. Creating new life in those that others have cast off. Justice is much more than that. And figuring that out is not easy. Mercy? Oh, mercy makes my head spin. How does mercy work? Does that mean that you just let people get away with things? Is that what mercy is? And if you don't, how does it work? Quite frankly, one of the things I struggle with the most is not understanding that I am to give mercy, but to understanding exactly how that works to have mercy and accountability together. Is that easy for you? If it is, see me after church and you can solve a large problem in my life. A few weeks ago, I had breakfast with a friend who had lost his, his wife. In, he's in ministry. And I asked him, how are you doing? He said, Kirk, we prayed and we prayed for her healing. But she died. I want you to know I still have faith. But sometimes I hang on by my fingernails. Have you had times like that? You still have faith. But boy, you are hanging on by your fingernails. Mercy, justice, faithfulness, love, forgiveness. Those things are the things that challenge me in my life. So I tend to agree with the tone I'm getting in this. We give because we think it pleases God and that's enough. Debbie and I also give because we want to believe that our life makes a difference. I'm going to show a video right now that, that talks about that. Actually, there's no words at all. It just shows what the impact of our offerings can be. And in many ways, this says what I want to say about making a difference with our lives.
sometimes it is so easy for Debbie and I to put our offering in the plate. My wife's old school. She loves the tactile feeling of checks. And uh, we put the offering in the plate, and then we leave church and say, pizza today? Something like that. But every once in a while, I start thinking about what that means. We want our life to make a difference. And we believe that one of the best places on earth is through the local church, our local church, that we love. There's almost two million not-for-profits out there. And a lot of them are very, very good. But we bring it first to the house of God. And it is our friends, it is our neighbors who are the leaders in the church. It is people that I know and I trust. And I know that our church is making an effort to be good stewards for which that they have begun. And on Sunday morning when we come in, when it's cold outside and the sanctuary is warm and the lights are on, I have been known to turn to my wife and say, we help do that. And when the children go to children's church, we help do that. And when the youth who bring in youth from around the neighborhood, a rough neighborhood, and they go on a skiing trip and, and they hear about the power of the Lord and how their lives can be better and they're making solid, good relationships, we help do that. Our church does a Wednesday night tutoring program to help children in the neighborhood and we help do that. When we have fellowships within the, the church, when there are weddings, when there are funerals, when there are times that people are in crisis and other people in the church connect to pray, we help do that. When we give to the state and the state reaches out, recognizing that our church is not a Lone Ranger, but we are part of a greater community. And we help other churches that have times of crisis and need or pastors who need training. We help. My wife and I, we do that. Isn't that cool? And when we reach around the world and we work through missionaries and the work that they're doing using skills that I don't have and places that I cannot be, making long-term difference in the lives of others around the world. We help do that. I served at Children of Promise. I saw children who had food who would not have food. I saw children have clothes and medical care and hear about a God who loves them and knows that that God loves them because the people of God, who they will never meet, reached out and made a difference in their lives. And to think, do I sound a little proud? Well, I would defend that. The word pride is used 12 times in the New Testament. Six times it's criticized. But six times it's praised if you're proud about the right thing. When we give through the ministry of the church, you're giving through a ministry you know you can trust. You know that it is tied to the kingdom of God and trying to honor Jesus Christ in every way. And we make a worldwide difference. You make a world in ways that sometimes you're not even aware of. I think that's an amazing and wonderful thing. When I was traveling for Church of God Ministries and Children of Promise, there was a lady in Ohio named Mary. I really love Mary. Now, actually, that's not a picture of Mary, uh, but it was an old woman, so I used it. You know how those old people can be. But I would visit Mary every time I went through her, her area of Ohio, and Mary had the joy of giving. She loved to give and was constantly looking. She gave to her church, but she also looked for other things to do. And Mary called me up one day and said, Kirk, I, I've heard that there are villages in Africa that do not have any water in the village. And I said, yes, that's true. In fact, I personally have been in villages like that in Africa. And, and she said, I've read also that the women and children are sent to fetch water, either from a river or from another village. They carry what they can, and they bring water back every day to the village. And yes, that's true, too. In the culture of almost everywhere in Africa, everywhere I know, it's the women and children who are sent to do those kinds of things. And it can be dangerous. Of course, there's, there's accidents and there's wild animals. But probably the biggest danger is that there are predators, men who are predators, uh, and in some places in Africa, uh, things that are crimes in the United States are hardly even noticed. And so she said, would you find out how much it would cost for me to put a well in a village in Africa? Isn't that cool? 
So I said, well, sure, Mary, I'll find out. And she mentioned the country where she wanted to do it. This was very, very isolated. And it cost a lot of money to get the equipment in to put dream, to drill the well. The main cost was just getting the equipment there. And I called Mary back up. And I, I had been in Mary's home many times. It was a World War II, I call it World War II home, built right after World War II, white frame, uh, wood home, very, very modest. When I went into her home, Mary liked to make me banana, I mean bread pudding. She made it from generic bread because she bought as generic as much as she could because she just loved to give and wanted extra money to give. And so I called Mary, who does all of these things, who lives so simply, and said, Mary, a well there is going to cost $4,000, and we can't guarantee there will be water. But that's what it will cost, and we think we can get water. And she said, well, Kirk, what do you want me to do? And the only answer to that is, well, Mary, I can't tell you what to do. You asked for information, and I've shared it with you. She said, okay. And then over the phone, I heard her crying. I will confess to you, I felt horrible. I thought of Mary in her little white frame house, generic bread pudding, the way she sacrifices. And I'm thinking, this is way, way too much. And she's feeling bad. She can't afford to do this. And she stopped crying. And then she said, I just can't believe that a little old lady like me can make a difference. And then she said, can I write the check today? <laughs> and she did. I have never prayed so much in my life that I prayed for that well to strike water. And it did. And I had them take pictures of the well, and, and they had a choir around the, the well. And they had a worship service around that well. And I told Mary, I have heard from them through the Internet, and Mary, they want to name the well after you. And she said, don't you allow them to do that. This well is named in honor of Jesus Christ. That's what she wanted on the well. I want to believe that the way I live my life, with all of the flaws that I have, I'm fortunate that Aaron didn't invite me to talk about flaws <laughs> But I want to believe that my life makes a difference. And I know you do too. The impact that Christians make around the world is amazing. It is amazing more than you know. The impact that your giving makes in this church, in this community is more than you know. Well, there's another reason that Debbie and I give. Uh, and this one allows me to tell one of my favorite stories because it's about french fries i love to tell stories about french fries frankly i heard another minister tell this story but i thought he stole it from me because what he he talked about was exactly what happened to me so i'm claiming the story is my own because it is my own when i was in alliance ohio my son was four or five years old and we were tooling down State Street, and I wanted to do some bonding with my son. I don't know if this is good parenting or bad, but I thought to myself that when he was young and still liked me, it was important to build up as many chips as I could. And so we're going down State Street, and I say to my son, hey, you want to stop for some French fries? And I bet you know the answer to that. So we went up the hill, there's McDonald's there, and we, we pulled in. Now, for those of you who worry about such things, this was a long, long time ago. Back then, French fries were health food. It was okay. And so, so we pull into McDonald's. I walk up the counter, and I get Brian some French fries and a Coke, and I get myself a Coke. And then we go sit down in a booth, and we're doing the father-son thing. I'm building up relationship for the future and, and all that. And he's, he's talking, and we're having a great time. And as he's talking... I just very casually reach over and take a fry and start to munch on it. And my young son put his arms out around the fries, pulled them closer to him and said, Dad, stop. These are my fries. Now, I want to be protective of him. That's age appropriate. 
I mean, that, that's how you are at a certain age. And, but I was sitting there, and I was thinking, didn't he walk in here with me? Wasn't he at the counter when I ordered the fries and I paid for the fries? Doesn't he have fries only because I gave him fries and now I want a fry and they're my fries? Quite frankly, I very clearly remember sitting there with my son thinking, yes, this is age appropriate, but how much Debbie and I value giving in life. In fact, we both believe that you're not a whole person, that there's damage there, that you're not complete if everything in life is about ourselves, if everything in life is about taking. You've known people that all they will think about is them, 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 what I can have, what I can get, what I'm going to get out of it. And after a while, don't you, doesn't it just seem like something's just not healthy there? I believe that to be a full and complete uh, person, that part of being a full and complete person is we think and live beyond ourselves, that we are not hampered just by the life we have, but how we can touch lives around us. That's part of what I think Jesus means about a life that is an abundant life. I think that's part of what he means when he says to find life, we lose our life. We give our life away to find life. I sat there thinking how important it was to me to at least in that one way, to teach my son to be like his father. The joy of giving, the importance of giving, the importance of living just to beyond ourselves because I want my son to be like his father in that way. And you're already ahead of me. We have a heavenly father who has given us literally everything that exists was by his word, by his creation. Every blessing in life literally comes from us. Any talent that you're particularly happy about or even proud about, that talent only exists because God created it and he made it so that we could have it. Anyone that you love and anyone who loves you, we have that because God created that within us. The promise of forgiveness, the promise of eternal life. And he sent his son who came saying, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And he calls us to be transformed into the very nature of Jesus Christ in our lives. And giving for me is part of that transformation process. It is part of of becoming. And so when Debbie and I give, I will make a confession to you. I'm a rich man. I feel that by giving, Debbie feels that by giving, our life has been blessed in ways that we can scarcely imagine or talk about. And so I hear that there are those who are worried about talking about this portion of our lives and how it ties to our faith. But what we do with what we have is part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So Debbie and I give and we give with joy. And there are people who are here today who can share the exact same testimony. We are so blessed, and so are you. Father, I want to thank you for all the great gifts that you have given us, the ways you have changed our lives, all that is promised, all that has happened. We are never alone. Help us in the way we live our life to reflect you with our entire life, our talent, our time, and also with our treasure. Amen. Can we go ahead and stand as we sing a closing song? In Christ alone, my hope is found. 
He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There in the ground his body lay, the light of the world by darkness. Bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ we stand I want to thank many of you for the warm welcome that you gave me today uh, the times I've been here you've been wonderful I think we live in a time when it is more needed than ever that Christians are reflecting Jesus Christ. In a world that is greatly divided, there needs to be mercy. In a world that fights with each other, there needs to be grace. In a world of hate, there needs to be love. I find myself praying more and more as I go out into our culture today, which is a very tense culture, that the world really needs to see what a Christian is. I believe that's true with our whole life. I'm going to pray for you for that today. Father, as we leave this place, as worship is over, the service begins. People need to see who you are. This world needs your love and forgiveness and grace and truth and path. And your plan is to use us. Father, as we walk and follow you in the path, help us to continue to do that and help us to grow in that, to do it well. In a world that desperately needs it, help us live what it means to follow you with our whole life. The worship is over. Help our service to begin. Amen.